Thanks for joining us for today's message. If you'd like to support this resource and others like it, you can do so by visiting our website, thechapel.cc, and select the giving option that works best for you. Enjoy the message. Amen, great to see you guys. Woo! Listen, before you're seated, don't sit down. Before you're seated, look at somebody you don't know and just wink at them. Go ahead, go ahead. It's not creepy. I know you're thinking, what a creepy church. What a creepy church. First Wednesday! Yeah! So great to see the first, first Wednesday of the year. You guys are Christians. You're here. That's awesome. Listen, I've got something on my heart I want to share for a little bit. Um, and it comes from, if, if, if you haven't been to First Wednesday in a while or you haven't been to the chapel at all, this is maybe your first time or... Whatever it is, you're not familiar with, with why we do things here or how we do things here. I just want you to sit back. A lot of times through conversations I have with people, um, they'll spark something that I'm already thinking in my mind about um, God wanting to say something to you through our church and through our worship leaders, through all of our pastors, through sometimes, of course, our staff, and then a lot of times through me is the guy who communicates the most. And so this, I've had this on my heart, and then I had a conversation with someone that solidified the idea. So just for a little while, I want you to just kind of, what do we say? I just want you to lean in a little bit to what God wants to say to you. Many times what happens is we, we will come to church or we'll join a group or we kind of hang out with friends that are Christians. Hopefully we do that. And then hopefully we have friends that aren't Christians so that our love and our influence and our grace and our mercy and our wisdom gets them into the kingdom of God. Can I get an amen there? That's, that's why we're here, guys. That's why we're here. <laughs> so um, and what I'll find is I'll have conversations with people and they'll like, well, I, you know, I, I came to church on the weekend or I came to a first Wednesday. Or I, I went to a group and God really spoke to me. and It was great. But when it's done, I go back. And I go back into the same situation after I've been to church or been to a group or been to a prayer meeting. And listen, I'm telling you right now, we're getting ready to fast for 21 days. We have done it since we have opened this church. The first part of the year given to God so that he can bless the rest of the year. Amen. Saturday morning prayer, 9 a.m. right here. It's going to be incredible. And we will start our 21 days of prayer and fasting starting this weekend. And they'll say to me, you know, but I have to go back to a job that I don't like and is ungodly and it's just dirty and they don't get it. I'm maybe a little persecuted because, you know, I'm a believer or I have a hard time living out my faith in that situation. I got to go back after church or after a group or after first Wednesday or after spending time with God. I go back to the relationship that I know isn't God, of God, but I can't get out of it right now. I go back to a marriage that's in turmoil. I go back into a situation situation that I know I need God in and it's really hard for me to be godly in. Is that, am I talking to anybody tonight? We'll leave here tonight, perfect example, and wherever you're watching from online after listening, what will happen is we will go back to a situation that is familiar after we have gone and sought the Lord or experienced God but we'll go back to a situation. Are you picking up what I'm laying down right now? We're, pick, we're going back into that workplace, that relationship, that marriage. I go back to whatever that is. And we have a tendency to not be like we just sang, victorious. And what will happen in those moments is we will self-deprecate. I can't do this. I'm not good. God didn't give me the strength. God's not hearing me. Why am I repeating the same mistakes? Why is this continually happening? I was on such a, a mountaintop. And then I go back to the same situation, but it winds up being the same, and it winds up being as hard, and it winds up being as hurtful, and it winds up being problematic. So just for a few minutes, here at the chapel, uh, 
We always say, there's nothing new under the sun. Why we say it? One, because it's biblical. There ain't nothing new. You may think it may be new to you, but that doesn't mean it's new. It's like a used car. It's new to you, but someone else has smashed that car before you bought it. All right. it's, it's, it's new to you, but it's not new. There's nothing new under the sun, especially when it comes to how God relates to us through his word in every situation. That's why it's so powerful. Going back into a situation that you've got to go back into. This is the story of Joseph, right? He has these brothers. They're kind of jealous because the dad favors Joseph a little bit. He deals with his brothers. They sell him into slavery. They disown him. The relationship is not good. Time goes by, but Joseph has to go back into a relationship with his brothers, if you know anything about the story. He has to go back into a relationship with his brothers. The difference is... He's now king and he has victory, but he's back in the same relationships with his brothers, but he has victory and is stronger and wiser than before. Why? David, simple. I just picked a couple of stories. David, he's king, a God, man after God's own heart. He morally fails with a woman named Bathsheba. He's lying on the ground in a fetal position, crying because the baby that came from an adulterous relationship has died. And he has to go and pick himself up and still be king in front of the same people he morally failed with. Back into the position, back into the level of influence. But why after that did he do more for God than he did before? Why was he now victorious? The prodigal son. Give me the checkbook and the keys to the Volvo. I'm out because I don't need you, but I need your money. Sound familiar? <laughs> I don't need you. So give me the keys, give me the checkbook and everything. I'm out. A situation leaves, squanders his life, squanders his inheritance, but has to go back into the relationship with his family. He has to go back and, of course, humble himself. He has to go Back into, much like you and I, after a mountaintop experience or spending time with God or at church or at a group or first Wednesday, some of us have to go back into a situation. But why does the story end with the father celebrating the son? Kill the fatted calf. Bring the gold ring. Honor him with a robe. What was different as the prodigal son went Back into a relationship. Back into the situation. Back into because there's a story that's going to teach us the why. When we leave here, just for, just for tonight, listen. When we leave here, we will go back to things that are rough, that are hard. We'll go back to the same jobs, sometimes the same relationships. My heart as your pastor is to show you a truth in the scriptures that although you go back into the same situation, it doesn't need to be the same result. Although you go back into the same frustration, it doesn't need to be the same result. Although you go back into the same almost scenario, it does not have to have the same result. It's a classic story that we can miss some of this uh, truth in it. It's a story of Peter and how Peter starts his ministry. He's called into ministry, called to follow Jesus. It's a certain situation that he's in. And then right towards the end of the relationship, Peter experiences the same exact thing, but Peter is different. 
situation we sometimes we can't control. Circumstances we know we can't control. Things sometimes that happen to us we cannot control. Half of our frustration is thinking we are in control. But what you find in identical situations in Peter's life is that Peter is different the second time around. Sorry, simple. This is the beginning of Peter being called to be a disciple. He, Jesus, said to Simon, Peter, put out into deep water. See, he's a fisherman. He's being called by Jesus. Put out into deep water and let down nets for a catch, Simon. Peter answered, Master, we've worked hard all night. Can you just see Peter for a minute, can't you? Dude, you kidding me right now? I know, I know. Yeah, son of God. Cool. Well, you're not a fisherman. I got it. I got you. This is what I do. This is what I do. This is what I fish. And you want me to do what? All night, brother. All night. You kind of get it. These are, these, are, these are people. These are real stories. Can I get an amen, right? Yeah, it's just master. We've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Peter gives me hope. Because when Jesus asks, asks me sometimes to do something, I'm not like, yes, Lord. Anytime you want. Whatever you want. Half the time, I am going, that's not God, that's the pizza. That's the pizza talking. Oh, Peter, Ras, come on, all night. I don't know if I told you, but we just didn't start. I know you see us, we have nothing, but we've been at this for a while. We've been at it all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. They came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Wah, wah. Right? Yeah. Notice how uh, specific the author is, Luke, about the, the details of the story. What we say at the chapel all the time is every word that's in the Bible should be there. Every word that's not there shouldn't be there. The Bible is actually a perfect piece of literature because it is God's voice to us today. All right, but it's just interesting... When you look at the words, it's very, very, you, you kind of pick up attitude. You kind of pick up the particulars, nets, no fish, fish. Well, because you say so, I let down the nets, and what do you, lo and behold, filled both boats so full they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I am an idiot. <laughs> oh, I feel so bad. I just, oh, Golly, he made me look so stupid. Okay, okay, that's why you're God, it's why you're God. Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of the fish. They were like, man. This is Peter being called to be a disciple. Beginning of Peter's whole career. And then, of course, Jesus says to Simon Peter, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. You'll be fisher, a fisher of men, some translations. It's the beginning of the story. Well, fast forward. Peter has this experience in this situation with Jesus. Well, now... Peter has traveled with, witnessed, and experienced what life is like with Jesus. He follows him. He now is left confused, doubtful. He has watched them crucify the Savior. No one, none of the disciples know what to do. What's next? They don't know. But Peter does. He says to the disciples, hey, I'm going fishing. Re-entering the same situation he had with Jesus in the beginning. Re-entering the same situation as he had in the beginning with Jesus. Hey, look, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, well, of course, you know, we'll go with you. We'll go with you. 
So they went out and got into the boat. Boy, the story sounds really familiar. Can I get an amen right there? Right? It's just funny. It's funny. We'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught what? Oh, weird. They caught nothing. Right. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. Jesus has resurrected already. He has conquered it all, including death. Although the disciples don't know what's next, God always knows what's next because he knows what's better than for us than we know for ourselves, right? Right, he knows what's next. They're confused. They don't know what to do. Historians and theologians have used the idea, well, Peter went back to what he knew because he didn't know what to do. And that's plausible, sure. But I would argue that there's a bigger thing happening and a deeper meaning. Peter is right back. He goes back into the situation that he was in when it all started. Now, we know a little bit of the story of Peter. He's quick-tempered. He's outspoken. He's passionate. He's loud. Cuts the ear off of the centurion soldier. Steps in front of Jesus. No, this isn't going to happen to you. Jesus calls him the devil. What a guy. He gives me hope. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Yeah. We also know that he denies Jesus three times after Jesus tells him, hey, listen, no, it's never going to happen, Jesus. No one's going to deny you. And by the way, especially me, I will never. And of course, Jesus bursts his bubble and goes, no, actually, you're the worst. Actually, three times. Before you hear the bird, what's going to happen? Three times you'll deny me. Oh, no, I won't. No, I won't. Peter is uh, racked with guilt and shame because everybody knows what's happened. He doesn't know what to do next. Savior's gone. But he reenters the same situation. The Bible says, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. They don't know who it is. Somebody's on the shore, but they're in a boat. They're catching nothing. Sound familiar? They're in a boat. Who's the guy? Who's that guy over there? Who's that guy? And then all of a sudden, he, Jesus, called out to them, friends. Didn't even call them disciples. Peter, John, didn't do that. Let's see if they can figure it out on their own. <laughs> friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. It's the same situation. They're re-entering the same situation. Peter is entering again, going back into the same situation as when he was first called by Jesus. He says he had thrown the net on the right side, Jesus says of the boat, and you will find some. And when they did, lo and behold, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. All right. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, and we know this, if you're not familiar with it, John fancied himself as Jesus' favorite. He just did. He was that guy. That guy who went, no, I'm God's favorite, and you went, who cares? I don't like you. That's what we do. That was John. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him because he had taken it off and jumped into the water. Typical Peter drama, right? (laughs) Typical. But the key thing to remember, much like you and I, after experiencing and walking with Jesus, and seeing Jesus, and seeing what he could do, and failing sometimes even on our own walk. He goes back into a situation, but it's different this time. Peter's interaction in the same situation that he goes back into, much like a relationship, much like a job, much like a marriage, much like whatever it is, Peter is different now than he was when Jesus first called him. 
And I would say that tonight what the Lord wants to say to you, that no matter what situation you and I return to, you and I were meant to live victorious. That you and I were never meant to be a victim. That you and I and those who call upon the Lord and who are named and created by him, that's you. We're meant to be more than conquerors. Even though we may go back into a situation that has changed. Oh boy, if we allow the Lord, he'll change us. And here you see it. So just for a few minutes. They're on a boat, like the first story. They're trying to catch fish, like the first time. They got an empty net. There was an empty net in this time again. Put the net back. Got to put the net back in. Throw it on the right side. Hey, you know what? Throw the net out in the deep. You'll catch fish. Look at the similarities. Back into the same sort of situation. Not just a fisher, but whoo-hoo, fisher of men. But this time, Peter's different. This time, it's different. Right, right. Jesus stood, here we go, lean in. Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. They don't know. But then the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. Here's the idea. When you're going back into a situation that you know isn't good, isn't favorable, you don't like it, but you have to, it's hard to be victorious. Here Peter is in the same situation, but he's different. He doesn't know if it's the Lord. He doesn't know if it's Jesus, but John turns around and says, hey, I want you to know it is the Lord. As, as soon as Simon heard it, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, took it because he took it off and jumped into the water. Ready? You got to have the right inner circle of people telling you that that's not Instagram, that's not the devil, that's Jesus. You gotta, if I go back into a situation that's hard for me, the difference now is Peter, instead of just reacting and being full of drama, Peter is listening to a right relationship guiding him in the right way. All of a sudden, oh, because the Bible says they didn't know who it was, but the minute John you see, John was gone, has gone through the experience with Peter. John has been with Peter. John understood what it meant to follow Jesus. John understood. John had some experience. And I'm going to bring this value up every single time. Part of our problem is we're asking the right questions to the wrong people. Oh, we're asking the right things, but you asking the wrong people. And what you find when we got to go back into the same situation, Peter doesn't recognize Jesus. He leans on a horizontal relationship to bring clarity. Because if Peter misses it, he misses his destiny. He misses the promise of God. He misses what God would be saying to everyone today. Your past doesn't dictate the future. Your obedience to what God has said and done writes your future. All right. Well, first thing, they didn't know who it was. Just used to, it's just the Bible, guys. They didn't know who it was until John. You got to have the right inner circle. We all have a different level of friends. But let me be clear, not every friend is the same. And not every friend is meant to be close. When you got to go back to a situation that you know you need to be victorious in, it's the same sit empty net, boat, caught nothing, throw the net in, same thing. It's the same thing. What's the difference? Peter's got the right inner circle. Peter's got, we're going to launch groups the first weekend in February here at the chapel. I'm telling you now, because as your pastor, I expect you to make margin for it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> because according to the Bible, it's one of the ways that we get healed from pains and wounds and scars. It's one of the ways that we find the right relationships. One of the ways. One of the biblical ways. What you find is you got to have the right inner circle. Soon as he heard, what? Did you say it was Jesus? 
Boom, Peter jumps right in. Second, ready? He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? Remember, especially when Jesus, in the Old Testament, God, Yahweh, New Testament, Jesus, when Jesus asks a question, don't think it's because he doesn't know the answer. I don't know. Hey, do you catch any fish? I can't really tell. I can't. Is that fish? Is that your overnight bag? I can't tell. Is it the net? What is it? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey, John the Baptist, what do you think? They got fish? What do you think? No. What is Jesus saying when you have to go back into the situation but you want it to be different? You've got to have the right inner circle telling you it's God and telling you it's not. Telling you what to say. When to say it, based on God, based on who you are in Christ, not based on some quip on Instagram. You've got to have the right inner circle that sees you the way God sees you. That believes in you the way Jesus believes in you. But then, Jesus calls to them, friends, haven't you had any fish? Right away, the answer, no. Listen, where I live, I get the opportunity to kayak fish. It undoubtedly, I'm, I, listen, I fish because it relaxes me. You don't want to see this tense. This is bad, tense. I'll go out and fish. I'll catch some fish, but it doesn't matter. You want to know why? Because when people walk, come by me, they're like, hey, catch anything? How is it? I'll be out there four hours and catch nothing. You know what I say? Pretty good. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. I haven't had a bite in four years, in four hours. <laughs> How is it? Sometimes I'll lie. Just letting you know. Catch anything? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But we're far enough away and I put my head down so I don't have to tell them what I caught. It was seagrass, but that doesn't matter. I caught something. I think sometimes what happens is we put on a little bit of a, a show. I think sometimes we put on a little bit of a show for Jesus. Remember Peter's first response in the beginning of the story. Hey, throw your nets out to the deep. Hey, 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 hey. Whew. We've been fishing all night long, brother. We got nothing. There's, there isn't this, okay. It was almost like, We know what we're doing. We got this. But now, hey, have you caught anything? No show. No mask. No. Because when I got to go back into a situation and I want it to be different, you have to ask this question. Are you willing to admit what you are doing or what you have done is not working? No, we ain't got nothing. See, it's only in admitting what you don't have in a relationship with Jesus. It's only in his miracle. The miracles only happen when you tell him what you don't have. He goes, well, let me tell you what you need and let me tell you I'm the one who can supply it. It's when they understand. It's when Peter understands we ain't got nothing. What I'm doing or what I've done. It ain't working. We're talking about killing your pride. I got this. I got it. See, when we got to go back into situations where we need a victory, when we got to go back into situations that we don't want it to end up like the last time we were in that situation, well, I got the right inner circle, but I also have to go... <laughs> Hey, the last time, however I did it, however I was in this situation, the job, the relationship, the marriage with the kids, whatever it is, it's not working. Whatever you have that you're trying to do on your own will not work. Don't get duped into believing that because it worked for a little bit, it's going to work for a long time. Because you and I were not constructed to do anything by ourselves, void of our creator. Now all of a sudden, Peter, no, we've not caught anything. Right, because Peter knows. Let me give you this thought. This is what I have found in my life. 
There has to be, I think it's up here, uh, I don't know, it's somewhere, I don't know where my notes are. So ready? Listen. There has to be a level of spiritual exchange. What? There has to be a level of spiritual exchange. Listen to me. Listen. If I want God's hope, if I want the hope of Christ in my life in all situations, you have to exchange your control for his hope. You can't hold on to your control and ask for his hope. They cannot coexist. That's why the Bible uses the metaphor, light cannot be where darkness is and darkness cannot be where light is. When light comes into the room, darkness has got to go. When, if I want the peace of Christ in my heart and in my mind and in my home, you got to stop holding on to things that cause strife. There has to be a level of exchange. What Peter is showing us is when you've got to go back into a situation where you need victory because last time didn't go so well. Come on, we, put, we fished all night. No, you got to go, hey, I'm done, man. I don't know what else to do. We caught nothing. We ain't got it. There's got to be the exchange of what you think you can do on your own. And Jesus goes, oh, you got an empty net? Good thing, because I'm in the net filling business. That there has to be an exchange that happens. So not only do I have to have the right inner circle so the situation doesn't end up the same. Just so we're clear, we... we, we it might, it might seem trite, but when Jesus is asked what's the most important thing, he doesn't say one, he says two, and they're connected. Love God all your heart, mind, and soul, and the second is like the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. He talks about the vertical and the horizontal. If all you got is vertical and no horizontal, you won't win the battle. Because that's not, that's not the way it goes. That's not the, how we're constructed to live. I can have the right inner circle, but then I have to put what I think works down so I can pick up what I know works with God. Well, and then the story goes on. Jesus says, well, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And on, somebody's got to hear this, and I don't know whether it's online or in the worship center. He says, throw the net. Here's the idea. you got to throw the net again. you got to throw the net again. we just given up too quick lately. Throw the net at oh, you, but you don't understand. I mean, throw the, I mean, I've been fishing all, throw the net again. No, we don't have anything. Throw it again. I got to tell you, this is where I'm out. This is where I'm out. I'm not throwing the net again. If you want us to have fish, poof, have them up here. I'm tired of throwing the net. I'm tired of throwing the net. I'm tired of it. Fishing all stinking night. Listen, I'm confused. I don't know what's going on. I've lost my savior. I don't know what's next. I feel shameful. I've, I've betrayed my friends. I've betrayed my God. And you won't, I'm not throwing the net again. But yet in the story, to be victorious, when I got to go back to a situation, I got to throw the net again. It plays out like this. Well, I prayed and nothing changed. You better pray again. Uh, I, well, I went to counseling and it didn't work. You better find another counselor and go to counseling. Because in the counsel of many, there is wisdom. And your wisdom ain't cutting it because your net is empty. You need God's wisdom. Right. Uh, all of a sudden, my last connect group was boring. It probably was. Not all, not all connect groups are great. There's some freaks in those connect groups. I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> it's just because we're human. We're people. <laughs> That's a terrible endorsement. But you, ready? but you better try a group again. But you better try a group again. Not because I said so, because the Bible said so. You, better, you got to throw the net. See, this is a net. I don't know what your net is, but stop. Throw it again. I don't know what your net is, but there's like some of them that I hear. And you are one net throw away from a miracle, but you sitting on the boat holding on to the net. Imagine, imagine if Peter went, I'm out. I'm not doing it. I'm doing it. We wouldn't be talking about him today. You got to throw the net again. My, I was serving and I didn't feel different. Maybe you served in a long area. That's possible. That's why we spend so much time trying to help you figure out your gifting, your wiring. 
You're still walking around long in the face and a little down when God is on the throne. You got problems, I got problems, we all got problems. But the problems ain't bigger than our God. We just sang it. But meanwhile, in the Bible, it says a person who refreshes someone else will be refreshed. What that tells me is the person who's not serving becomes selfish and becomes self-absorbed, and that will depress you. Well, you got to throw the net again. I don't know what your net is. I don't know what it is. But you got to throw it again, according to the story. So when you go back into a situation, which we all will, and we want to be victorious this time, you got to throw the net again. Ready? I was being generous, and it didn't help me. It didn't help me. I still feel bad. I don't know. I'm always complaining. I'm always. You better be generous again. You better throw the net again. Right. Why? Because that's what the Bible said. When Peter entered the same situation, boat, empty net, nowhere to go, didn't know what they were doing, he had to throw the net again. He had to throw it again. Oh, and then the story says, well, when Peter heard that it was Jesus, and they hear it thrown in the net, and it became full. Peter wrapped his outer garment around him and jumped into the water. He didn't. Jesus. Listen to the Bible. Listen to it. He jumped in the water. If you know anything about scripture, let me enlighten you for one minute. Every symbol in the Bible means something. Water has always and will always in the word of God, which is his voice, represent the Holy Spirit. It will represent the spirit of God. What Peter did was jump into God and fully immersed in the things of God. That's what the Bible is saying. He didn't try to walk on the water. It doesn't even say he swam. Some people think he swam. It says he jumped in the water, but he immersed himself in the things of the Spirit. Back into the same situation, but this time it's victorious. Peter jumps into the water. He's fully immersed. He's wet all over the place with the things of God, the Word, prayer, fasting, worship, the Sabbath. That's what we miss sometimes when we go back into the same situation and we don't have victory is we don't have the things that build up our spirit, man. We have things that build up our confidence, but not confidence in Yahweh or Jesus, confidence in we can do it. That's why the story says, hey, how's it working for you? What'd you catch? Well, nothing. So you're done with yourself, aren't you? He jumps into the water. Side note. I wouldn't be here all night. Listen, side note. Biblically, what they looked like when they were fishing, I've always thought it was odd that someone who's jumping into the water puts clothes on. Typically, when I jump into a pool, I have less clothes on. Can I get an amen, right? Yeah. But instead, Peter puts on clothes. He puts on clothes to jump in the water. Jewish history tells us that the only garment men men at that time wore when they were fishing was something called a tunic. We would call it underwear. It was, a, it was kind of a, a bigger garment that would go all the way down to the ankles. Typically, back then, you just fished with other men. But hear what Peter does, knowing because now he knows from the right relationships, it is the Lord. That's what makes him jump into the water. He knows if this thing gets wet... Go with me. It won't be appropriate for me to stand in front of my master. So what I'm going to do is get my outer garment and put it around me, not on me, around me like we tie a sweater. 
because I know I'm going to immerse myself and do whatever I can to get in the presence of God and show myself appropriately. Listen to me. Sometimes we treat God too much like a friend. He is God Almighty, holy, and the only one worthy of our worship, the only one who should have our attention, the only one that we would do things for, the only one we would change our behavior for, the only one we would change our thinking for. He is God, not waiting with a bat to punish you, but waiting as a holy God and Father to embrace you. Peter knew. See, he got into the things of God expecting to be in the presence of God. He got into the things of God, the Spirit. That's what the Bible's saying, expecting to be in his presence. All right. This is what we know. Very last thing that happens, they start cooking a little breakfast on the beach with the fish. Some translations actually give you the number of fish. Jesus kind of does this thing. Peter, yeah. You love me? Yeah, of course. See, because I'm Italian, I would have went, Peter, you love me? He goes, yeah. I went, really? Really? Cock crowing three times. Found familiar? That's what I would have done. Not Jesus. Okay. Ask him a second time. Peter, love me? Changes the wording a little bit. It says, feed my lamb. Feed my lambs. Ask him a third time. Peter, still Peter, right? He's like, Lord, you're kind of making me mad right now. You know I love you. Okay. Feed the church. Peter's destiny has always been and will always be regardless of the shortcomings, regardless of the temper and the knee-jerk reactions and his wiring, Peter always had a plan and he always had a purpose. Because years ago, Jesus said about Peter, this is Peter and this is who we will build the church on. If you go back into a situation, it's happened before. You've got to have the right relationships. You've got to immerse yourself in the things of God to have the victory back in a situation that's very similar that you might not have had before. You have to, you have to admit that what you were doing or what you've done isn't working. And you can never forget your destiny. You are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Set aside to do holy and good works, to make a difference in a world that rejects him, to make a difference, to move the kingdom forward. You can never, ever forget, Peter, your destiny. Don't forget what I called you to. To transfer God as a parent to the next generation. Don't forget what I equipped you for. To be a light in the darkness. Don't rem always remember that you were made in my image. Go feed the church. Remember that thing I told you about how we're going to build a church on you? It's still going to happen. Because the situation you're back in... Ooh, really familiar, really similar. You're not the same. But those are the steps. Because that's my heart as your pastor. We all got to go back to a place. But we don't have to go back the same, although that situation stays the same. We don't have to go back the same. Why? This Bible. Amen. Bow your heads. Let me pray for you. Thank you, Lord, that we get to hear your voice through your word. And, Lord, that no matter where we are, no matter where we go, no matter how dark, dismal, and dim the situation may be, 
Lord, I know you're with me. Lord, I open my eyes and my ears for the right relationships. Lord, I crush my pride. Lord, I lean into who you are. Lord, I know you love us. We know you see us. But Lord, because we worship you, because we want to hear your voice through your word, because we're praying to you. Lord, I'm throwing my net back in even though we might have been given up. We're throwing our nets back in, Lord. Going one more time, going two more times to you. Knowing we'll see a victory. Knowing that you're our God. Knowing though all those situations are the same, we're different because we have you on our side. Jesus, make us like Peter, passionate, courageous, trustworthy. Well, thank you for always talking to us. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for service today. We love that we get to serve you and your family. If you would like to continue your worship experience through giving, we have three simple, quick, and secure ways for you to do so. First, you can use text to give Simply compose a text message with the keyword thechapel.cc, followed by your gift amount to 77977. Hit send and follow the prompts. Or visit our website, thechapel.cc slash give and complete your giving online. Finally, you can always mail in your giving to the chapel at 1324 Seven Springs Boulevard, suite number 363, Newport Ritchie, Florida, 34655. Thank you for your continued generosity. We could not and would not want to do this without you.